Hi, my name is Sandy Baird, and we're here with our monthly show called What's Happening, in which colleagues of mine and I talk about the current issues that are facing our nation. Um, and there is a story, and this is with me is Kurt Maida, who is a lawyer and a uh, commentator on the, with me on this show a lot about current events. And there's a particularly troubling story that has hit the news uh, at least a little bit this um, month or this last couple weeks, and that is about uh, Dr. Fauci and experimentation on dogs, which has brought up to me at least and also to Kurt the whole idea of torture, um, which also occurs against humans in our very constitutional so-called system. So today we're going to start with that. How does torture figure into uh, our American society, which vows itself or which sees itself as a free, open, and non-coercive society? So we'll start with the news from Guantanamo in Cuba, where there is a prison, allegations of torture that go on there, and a recent case which dealt with that in Guantanamo. So hi, Kurt, what's going on with you? Hey, Sandy, okay, so uh, why are we talking about this today? I mean, you know, torture was in the news 10 years ago quite a bit, right. you know, uh, the famous torture memo uh, that was drafted during the Bush administration. So why are we talking about torture this week when all these other things are going on around the world? Uh, there was a case down in Guantanamo. Is, is Let's talk about what Guantanamo is for our viewers. Okay, sure. So Guantanamo Bay is a, a section of the province of Guantanamo, which is a province in, in eastern Cuba, uh, that, uh, that the United States leases from Cuba and operates a naval base on it. Mm -hmm. uh, the lease has been in effect since the end of the Spanish-American War. At the, 1904, about correct? About 1904, yeah, yeah 19, mm -hmm. uh, around that time frame. And part of the peace negoci negotiations between the United States and Spain, Spain right. not Cuba, the <laughs> not actual Cuba, right. you know, uh, affected party, but part of the peace negotiations with Spain involved the lease of this land in Cuba, as well as a certain amount of control over Cuba uh, that was placed in the Cuban Constitution through something called the Platt Amendment. And then we acquired the, the Spanish lost the Philippines, as well as many other mm -hmm. colonies. And essentially, the Spanish were completely wiped off the face of the Western Hemisphere. Exactly, anyway, the Western Hemisphere. Hemisphere, right. in right. terms of possessions mm -hmm. and colonies and territories. Mm -hmm. uh, so Guantanamo is a province, like a state, in, in eastern Cuba uh, that still belongs to Cuba, but within that province, is this small speck of land towards the water, near the water, called Guantanamo Bay. It's on the bay. Mm -hmm, that right. the United States op has operated a naval station. And a prison. And a, no. and a, and a prison uh, a, a, a increased in size substantially after the September 11th attacks on New York, Washington, and Pennsylvania. Right. Yeah. Okay, so, but the United States acquired that naval base against the wishes, basically, of the Cubans. They re acquired it, essentially, as a result of the Spanish-American War. Right, right. right. It, it wasn't against the Cubans' uh, initial wishes right. because the Cubans didn't have a place at the table to express what their wishes right. even were right. at exactly. the end of the uh, negotiations, you know, between Spain and the United States. Right. You know, it was only later that Cuba thought, hey, you know, this is a, a prime piece of real estate. And it's on the island of Cuba. It's right. on Cuba itself. Exactly. You know, it's kind of like thinking if a portion of, of uh, Vermont. Virginia, uh, right. yeah, uh, belonged to you know Mexico. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, n not no land crossing or anything like that. And it's on the furthest side of Cuba from the United States, geographically speaking. So it's not even near the nor northern part of Cuba, which right. is closer to the. Uh, uh, south of Florida. Right. So on that, uh, it used to be just a base, though, correct? It was just I mean, a, a naval US base. base. A na it was always a naval base. Right. Exactly. Because it gave the United States uh, a pretty strategic uh, presence 
in overseeing the, the uh, Caribbean. Exactly, right. You know, and, you know, it was probably helpful during the Second World War when the, when the Nazis were sending submarines mm -hmm. into the Caribbean, which was a fairly frequent occurrence. Mm -hmm, right. Uh, so it, gave the, it, gives, it currently gives the United States a, a very strategic position as far as the Caribbean is concerned and right. the northern portion of South America. Except that the Cubans have tried to evict the United States and they're right. unable to do so. They're also. unable to do so. Right. Uh, the, it's, it's essentially a power dynamic mm -hmm. here. Uh, the stronger party rules. And the, I think the, the lease is a couple thousand dollars a year that the United but the States United, But the Cubans don't accept payment. They don't accept the right. payment. The check yeah. physically, as far as I understand, physically goes to Cuba as mailed. A couple thousand dollars still. I think uh, the, the rent was set at, during the early portion of the 20th century and it's been set in perpetuity right. without any modification and cost of living. But the, the Cubans say, we want you out, so we're not going to accept right. any money from you yeah. to continue I mean, that tenancy. The, the, the Cuban position yeah. is that, look, we, yeah, we weren't part of the negotiations. Right. It's one thing if we made a bad deal, that's on us. But they weren't at the table when exactly. the deal was made. Mm -hmm. it, the deal was made, made with a European power about four to 5,000 miles away. Right, but Spain. Uh, Spain, right. Spain, right. namely right. Spain. Okay, so what goes on there now? Okay, so since the September 11th attacks on the United States and on 9-11-2001, within three weeks after the attacks, uh, the Bush administration, George W. Bush at that time, the President of the United States, uh, al allowed for the use of that base, uh, a portion of that base, specifically an area called Camp Delta, uh, to be used for the incarceration of what are called unlawful enemy combatants. From where? From anywhere. Right. Uh, that were participants uh, in the war on terror. Uh, well, not participants, but actual, you know, adversaries. Well, were they ever the proven war. to be? That's a, that's a whole. That's a whole different that's, question. That, that's a whole right. other ten right. shows that we could exactly. probably have. Exactly. Uh, but that this was one of the places they they were they were located and uh, cordoned off from the rest of the world. So, they, But they were taken from foreign countries That's as correct. well. They were, were, they they were mostly taken from foreign countries. Yeah, okay, they so weren't in they, Cuba right, to begin by with. By the United States. By the United States as well as its partners and... and uh, England? Uh, uh, its uh, uh, coalition partners in the, in the war on terror that was prosecuted after September 11th. Is that NATO, largely? Uh, largely NATO, but there were countries, you uh -huh. know, there were countries from the Middle East, from South Asia, there mm -hmm. were uh, countries from all around the world. That nabbed people in these countries. Yeah, during the course of combat as well as in the course of everyday life, mm -hmm. living in a city, for example, not, you know, so we're, we're imagining these are people with, you know, bazookas on their shoulders, mm -hmm. you know, running around aiming at American tanks. Mm -hmm. uh, but in some cases, these were accessories to or operations, or not, as we'll talk about, mm -hmm. uh, that were picked up uh, on city streets, living in, you know, living with their families, and brought to third-party sites, in many cases, which are known as black sites, in uh, actions of extraordinary rendition, and then interrogated, and in many cases then eventually would be sent to Guantanamo. But Bay. sent to black sites first? In, in many words? cases. Okay. And so in some cases, the black site was Guantanamo Bay right, itself. Right, 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 right. So these black sites were managed in some cases by the Central Intelligence Agency. Yeah, so it's important to note that what happened after September 11th as the country was mourning within, uh, within about- shocked. A, and shocked and mourning, mm -hmm. you know, its, its losses and, and really uh, upset about what was happening. Uh, what the U.S. Congress did was they uh, passed a joint resolution uh, with one notable uh, uh, st uh, holdout. A Who was it? Barbara Lee. Barbara Lee. Right, right, uh, right. However, everyone else voted in favor of this joint re resolution, which was the Authorization for the Use of Military Force. It's called AUMF. That's mm -hmm. what we'll refer to it as. Mm -hmm. But it was not a declaration of war. No, it was not a declaration of war. It was an authorization for the use of military force. And what it gave President Bush at the time, who asked for this authorization was all appropriate and necessary means to prosecute the war on terror. Right, okay. And there was an extremely broad interpretation of the, of the words 
necessary and appropriate, which basically allowed the administration, the president at the time, to essentially do whatever was necessary against any country, against any party, any place in the world. And it also, the administration, it was the administration's point that it allowed them to also set up extrajudicial ju courts, mm -hmm. prisons, black sites, uh, methods of interrogation, which were controversial, which we can even call torture, as we'll talk about yeah, today. Right. Uh, but the, this use of force authorization, AUMF, as, we'll call, as we mentioned, uh, that was taken by the administration and really by the Congress as do what's ever necessary. To do what? To protect the homeland. Okay. and to fight terror. The, if you look at the actual language in the AUMF, there's a preamble to it, and it basically recites what happened on September 11th in the United States as far as the attacks, and refer to them you know, as treacherous attacks, and that essentially they needed to be avenged. And avenged? Avenged. So it wasn't defensive, necessarily. It was not defensive. It certainly wasn't defensive. Mm -hmm. uh, to catch the perpetrators, to prosecute the perpetrators, of bring them in, of, of the September 11 attacks, yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, to give the president all the, the means necessary to do that. Wow. Yeah. And so what, what was the result of that? So the result of that, so one of the... Did, did that go through both? Houses of Congress? It did. It was a joint resolution. Right. It was a joint resolution. Mm -hmm. So essentially it was looked at as... Carte blanche. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was open season mm -hmm. to give the president, you know, the means necessary to, to, to justify, you know, actions that would not require further um, advice and consent. From and so the, the president had pretty branch. totalitarian powers to Absolutely. do whatever he wanted. Absolutely. That one single person. Right. Okay. Great. Right. All right. Right. I mean, the first uh, the first time that the AUMF was was cited unsuccessfully was in 2006, five years after it was authorized, where there was a case uh, called Hamden versus Rumsfeld. Right. Right. It was uh, decided by the U.S. Supreme Court that basically. Uh, the, the basis for the case was the establishment of these tribunals uh, that were, you know, that were outside of the normal U.S. court system to prosecute any captives that were uh, essentially acquired through any means. Mm -hmm. And the case basically was decided at the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court decided that it was unconstitutional for the executive branch of the United States to set up a tribunal of mm -hmm. any type or a court. Mm -hmm. uh, it gave the president very clear instructions on to how, how to go about actually establishing one of these through an act of Congress, which is what the president got afterwards. Uh -huh. An act of Congress was sub subsequently passed and it allowed what? For the formation of these military commissions. Yeah, but that was in 2006. That is correct. So nothing happened between 9-11, 2001, and 2006? In but terms what? of what? what do well, you mean in terms happened? of nabbing terrorists and then... Well, terrorists were nabbed. Okay, and, and brought to... To, to Guantanamo right. in some cases, right. as well as black sites. But And that happened as quickly, I think right. I mentioned before, as within three months of the attacks. Okay, great. People that's were, that's they, what I thought, too. Yeah, they started bringing people to Guantanamo. And uh, what did they... Okay, so I had two questions. So was that legal of, again... Uh, in our Constitution to bring, well, so, what was the legal argument about Right, this? so I mean, this is where it gets really interesting. Yeah, right. Uh, you know, at the time, uh, the, the Bush administration created this new legal category to classify uh, these captives, as the term we'll use, and uh, they refer to them as unlawful enemy combatants. Now, that wasn't just a way to sound fancy on TV, on, on, on TV news. There was a, a very specific reason why they were called that, because essentially the administration created, carved out a new category right. of captive that was not mentioned in the Geneva Conventions to which the U.S. is a party of. Okay, the Geneva Conventions passed, I think, in 1954, maybe? Uh, I would, I, even that, earlier, but, yeah, Okay, even but earlier. the Geneva yeah. Co Conventions kind of um, set up rules about how you treat right. they set up prisoners of war, right? They essentially set up a framework right. and, you know, certain rights that, that they had, you know, whether prisoners it's... Prisoners of war. Pr that prisoners of war have, you know, certain basic, basic uh, 
you know, rights that they would have in terms of treatment, in terms of uh, things torture. that they can do, and things that they would be free from, torture being mm -hmm. a, a big one. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, rights to Red Cross visits, uh, a, lo a lot of different kinds of mm -hmm. things. Basic standards established in terms of food, education, mm -hmm. family visits. Uh, so the administration's contention uh, and Bush the U.S. signed that. That is correct. The okay. U.S. is a party to mm -hmm. the Geneva, mm -hmm. Geneva Conventions. Uh, the U.S. contention after September 11th was that this was a new kind of war. The methods that the terrorists were using were unconventional, and therefore they had to be prosecuted and held in an unconventional manner. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what would justify this very different ca category, which, of course, the Gene Geneva Conventions don't even recognize this category of unlawful combatants. There's no such thing. Right, so it right. was essentially made up, you know, it's, it was essentially a, a, a means of, you know, carving out your own exception. If, mm -hmm. if you look at a body of law and you didn't like what you saw, let's create something, you know, from, from, from scratch. Right. Which is what they did. Mm -hmm. And what, what this category did, this unlawful uh, enemy combatant category did, was it basically exempted the United States from offering some of the fundamental rights that we offer everyone else in the country, mm -hmm. including, you know, suspending their right uh, or ability to even file habeas corpus. Okay, we get right, right, right. Okay, so right. if you were caught and sent to Guantanamo, what you're saying as an enemy combatant, yeah. different than prisoner of war. Right. First of all, there was no war declared in the first place, correct? There wasn't a war. Okay. Right. All right, so these enemy combatants from all over the world sent to Guantanamo, yeah. you're also saying because they do not fit the normal category of a of a war prisoner, a prisoner taken by war, they basically had no rights. They basically had no rights, right. and and the other th the other thing, in addition to this, you know, authorization for use of military force, the AUMF, the other thing that was done a couple of months, you know, or I'm I'm actually going to venture to say even a few weeks mm -hmm. after the September 11th attacks was the USA Patriot Act was right, exactly. initially mm -hmm. passed. Yeah, and what one of the stipulations in the act was that. Uh, any of these so-called enemy uh, combatants, unlawful enemy combatants, would, uh, their cases could not be heard by U.S. courts. Why not? Because it was considered, they were considered uh, outside of the, uh, the U.S. court system. But in no court system, then. Essentially, right. right. Oh, yeah, right. right. That's, okay. that's, that's what, what it But what they were arrested by the United States, yes. largely. Okay. Yeah, and they were under the control of the United right. States. Right, right. Uh, but the fact that Guantanamo wasn't physically in the, in the territory of the United States, for a number of years, the Bush administration was able to get away with uh, essentially saying that these folks had no rights. And uh, the U.S. courts because had they no were on foreign soil. They were on foreign soil, and even and, though we contend that we had a lease there. Right, right. right. So I mean, that was a, a case later decided. Uh, uh, the U.S. versus uh, or Bomadine versus Bush, mm -hmm. which is also a Supreme Court case, in which uh, Justice Kennedy, at the time, uh, wrote the opinion and basically stated that, you know, the the odd situation that we have with Guantanamo. Uh, is that, you know, even though Cuba is considered the sovereign, we're still legally considering that Cuba is the sovereign nation in this instance. Yeah, sure. But mm -hmm. the United States, has, according to the lease, has full control and jurisdiction right, right, over this. Right, uh, just they, like any landlord. Right, just like any right, landlord, right. right. Bas you look at the basics of any landlord-tenant, mm -hmm. you know, issue. Yeah, uh, it's not that, you know. So yeah, then he creates see. the category. He puts them in a foreign country, and this is pretty clever on his part. President Bush. Yeah, President yes. Bush. Yeah. Okay. So then, what happens? So until this case, this uh, uh, Bomadine versus Bush, until that was decided, uh, Justice Kennedy basically extended the right of habeas corpus to when? these prisoners. I think this was in 2008. Okay. So mistaken. between. 2001 and 2008, those prisoners were stuck there. Right. Okay, right. so let's talk a little bit about habeas corpus because we did another sure. uh, program on habeas corpus. Yeah. What is habeas corpus? And these prisoners were denied that right. That is okay, correct. So what is it in the first place? Okay, so I mean, you know, uh, not to give you guys a Latin lesson, but you know, habeas corpus means showing the body mm -hmm. or, Show, having, or right. having the body. Right. And what it basically does, it's a, it's a fundamental right that came from all the way back from the Magna Carta. From Britain. You know? Yeah, from Britain, uh, you know, a thousand years ago, where basically uh, it's, 
It's a means that's given to prisoners to uh, contest detention. And at, or an arrest. Yeah, or an arrest. Right. Uh, so, you know, uh, situations where someone is detained without cause, without reason, and they're not informed what they're being arrested for, uh, that can't, and without being charged, that can't happen, you know. With, under our Constitution. Under our Constitution. So Article 1, Section 9 uh, of our Constitution actually incorporates a provision of the habeas corpus philosophy and basically so, states, well, it, it states that, uh, that the writ of habeas corpus can't be suspended unless there's rebellion or an invasion of the country. Okay, so that essentially means you, that the government can't disappear you right into some black hole of a prison that the government has to or the court has to you have the right yeah you have the right to show up to, to be, to be held to be brought to court to brought to court before an impartial judge and that judge decides whether there was probable cause to keep you detained right in the first place right correct? so uh, you know again in the at the end that doesn't mean you're going to be released no it doesn't it just, right. but it just means that there has to be some sense of formality in your detention, you know that the, right. that you you know they can't just like you said just have as someone they can disappear. in other countries as they can in uh, other countries. Right. Yeah. So you can't be swept off the streets and put right. forever in some black hole of right. a prison. Right. Correct? But so I, I did want to ma mention the fact that you know because our, our show was on torture, what happened this yeah. week in, in Guantanamo? But what happened first of all in Guantanamo back then there was right. torture, right? Correct. Yeah. So there was a case, uh, a sentencing hearing. Uh, in Guantanamo Bay this past week, uh, in which this... Uh, so people are still there. There are still 38 uh, detainees in Guantanamo right. Bay, many of whom, you know, uh, there were hundreds at one point, I know. many of whom were never charged of any crime. Right. Yeah. So th this uh, one man who was a immigrant from Pakistan with his family, uh, who actually went to high school in Baltimore, uh, Got in with the wrong crowd and in the United States. Yes, yeah. He so then he you know then he went to uh, Pakistan and he was convicted of uh, providing fifty thousand dollars. He was involved in uh, Al, Al Qaeda operations in Pakistan. Correct, okay. and Pakistan, the United States, uh, and uh, in Indonesia, the terrorists. And then he was also recruited as a suicide bomber uh, by Al, Al Qaeda. And anyway, so he was he was caught. And he was taken to by the United States. By the United States, uh, and he was subjected to torture. He had a sentencing hearing last week in, in Guantanamo, where there was a military jury, and he a jury. That is correct. Mm -hmm. There was a military jury, and the jury was able to hear his final uh, statement. He was allowed to make a statement in court. Statement lasted for about two hours, and he provided mm. excruciating detail uh, of what happened to him during the course of his stay in Guantanamo. He's been there for almost 20 years now. He, he, uh, he was there as a, you know, he just got boy. out of high school. Now he's a middle-aged man. His father and sister were able to see him. They were, uh, because they're U.S. citizens, his father and sister. So they went to Guantanamo? They went to Guantanamo. Okay. They mm -hmm. didn't recognize him when he came into the room. It had been 20 years. He looked like a different oh, man. man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, he went into excruciating detail about what had happened to him. Now, he's, for the last 10 years, he's been cooperating with the U.S. government uh, mm -hmm. and, and to the extent that he can in terms of revealing any knowledge that he had about al-Qaeda, about and operations, names. to the extent that he knew them. Yeah. Uh, so he was essentially a courier at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, you know, he was convicted of this, of this crime. They were, he was given a deal for cooperating. He's supposed to get out po possibly this coming February. Um, Jesus. Yeah, so he was, he was given some form of clemency. Um, and the military jury was so affected by his two-hour exposition on what happened to him, he read a 39-page letter that he wrote himself mm -hmm. uh, about what he experienced in Guantanamo. That the and I'm going to use a quote. The military jury, afterwards, the foreman of the jury put a, a note out to be published uh, and handed to the judge. And the treatment was so abominable: uh, beatings with hoods, you know, all kinds yeah. of sexual uh, depravities, uh, lots of waterboarding, being hung up from a, yeah. a ceiling. 
uh, having no. hoods, yeah, having hoods applied to him, putting in, putting him in what they call dog boxes with dogs. No, oh. with insects for days at a time, um, and he had scars all over his body that he showed during the course of his uh, uh, release or what you know sentencing hearing, uh, and the. Military juror, now this was a naval captain who had seen combat himself and been involved in lots of operations, you know, essentially called it, and I'm reading this, he said that this was a stain on the moral fiber of America and that the treatment, the guy's name was Majid Khan, the captive, the treatment of Mr. Khan in the hands of U.S. personnel should be a source of shame for the U.S. government mm. because of the degree of torture that this man faced. And the president at the time, in 2005, President Bush, insisted that there was no torture being right. taking, taking place. Right. Just uh, interrogation methods or something. How did it Enhanced, work? Interrogation. Enhanced interrogation. Uh, these interrogation methods were discussed in detail with top people in the administration, including uh, Secretary Powell, who just passed away, Condoleezza Rice, the vice president, and uh, subsequently, the interrogation methods were also discussed with a, a number of congressional Democrats, many of whom are still there. About President Sp Obama? Uh, I don't know. Mm. I mean, he wasn't around in 2002, right. No, I mean, once he came into office. Honey. Yeah. Uh, but, I mean, when they were contemplating the use of these techniques, yeah. I use the term technique, uh, you know, uh, as, guardedly. Uh, uh, guardedly. Mm -hmm. uh, Speaker Pelosi was also advised, and that th that these were going to be used. Sp were yeah. going to be. Yes, and, and they were probably being used already, but they wanted to let the congressional Democrats know that these methods of enhanced uh, interrogation were going to be put into place, uh, specifically with respect to a, a terrorist that was caught. His name was Abu Zubaydah uh -huh. at the time. Uh, and it's a whole other, we can have a whole other show yeah, to talk right. about Zubaida. Right. Uh, but uh, at the time, the description as to the reactions of the congressional Democrats, as well as top people in the Bush administration regarding the use of these techniques was uh, acquiescence to downright mm -hmm. support mm -hmm. at the time. So uh, that's, I mean, that's what we're talking about. So the idea that this was just President Bush or that this was uh, just his administration or Dick Cheney. Uh, this was known across the board right, right. by top leaders in our government. And, you know, the, for people that are watching or are thinking, you know, but look, I mean, you know, how horrible were the 9-11 attacks? I mean, one of the worst things that have ever happened, you know, that in, in people's memory. Uh, remember, the issue regarding torture, most top military personnel you know, are usually against the use of torture. I know, because it can be used against our people, too. It can be used against well, our people. Yeah, right. It's also... McCain was. Mc right, right, right. It's also uh, a source of acquiring false information. Sure. Even right. this uh, man, Majid Khan, said that he was ready to tell them anything to get the torture to stop. Abu Zubaydah, who I just mentioned before, who was caught, they pinpoint a lot of the intelligence that he released, supposedly, as reasons for suspecting that Saddam Hussein was involved with al-Qaeda. Hmm. And it was a reason for going into Iraq, one yeah. of the reasons yeah, right. for going into Iraq. Right. So, I mean, you really have to question some of the intelligence that you gather during, you know, these, uh, these the, the application of these techniques, mm -hmm. um, whether or not you can really, you know, rely on them if they're, if it's, intelligence that, you know, that you can really act upon. But even with that, I mean, that's a very important argument that you don't get any real information out of torture anyway. Yeah. Um, but the other argument is it's just simply inhumane. I mean, there's, there, I mean. We like to think we're above that. I know, and we're yeah. not, we're not. Yeah, and, and that's sad. And for people that are thinking, well, you know what, we need to do what's necessary. There were lots of cases of mistaken identities. Wow. In, these, in these situations, mm -hmm. where people were picked up off the streets, mm -hmm. uh, even in Western countries in many cases, mm -hmm. as close by as Canada. Mm -hmm. you know, yes, in Syria, a guy yeah. from Syria, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, someone was picked up and they had nothing to do with this. Right. And for folks who think, well, you know, what are you going to do? Uh, it, it's not going to happen to me. You know, remember, I mean, there were people like John Walker Lind who were, you know, 
yeah. Caucasian young men, you know, look like the average college student at UVM who, you know, were picked up mm -hmm. and caught. Anyone can be mistaken for that person. If you think it can't happen to you, you know, it's those people that yeah, it right. happens to. Right. You know, right. it could be your own son or, or, or brother, mm -hmm. you know, who could be mistaken for a John Walker Lind. And they could be subjected to So torture. what happened to our Constitution? During what happened to our Constitution? That's, yeah, so, you know, I mean, we've Which been, is, I think, similar to stuff that's happening today also. Well, I mean, the Constitution is clear about this. It's, right, it's a matter right. of whether or not, you know, the Constitution is applied and interpreted correctly in these instances. Did the this ever get to the Supreme Court? What? The torture. Uh, many, there were many <laughs> cases that went before the uh, Supreme Court regarding habeas corpus right, regarding, and the rights, right. but not the issue of torture. Uh -huh. Not ever the, uh, no? No, no. Mm -hmm. There's not been a case that's actually, that's actually gotten a writ of certiorari at the Supreme Court regarding torture, nor have anyone been, has anyone been you know, paid damages for torture, especially in situations, instances where it was a case of mistaken identity mm -hmm. on the part of the government. So what does an American citizen do now? So what, what's, what's going to happen to this guy that basically was just cleared or whatever, well, he not cleared? Not I don't cleared. mean that. I, I mean, mean that. I want to, again, go back to, yeah. you know, the military, the, 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 the foreman of that military right. jury, you know, made it very clear that he did not approve of the actions of this man. Or the guy wasn't man, acquitted. Yeah, he either. wasn't acquitted. He wasn't a good guy. He made some very terrible mistakes mm -hmm. earlier on in his life. Right. Uh, however, uh, you know, the, the use of torture was unjustified and, 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 and the type but of... But it always is. It always is, yeah. yeah. But uh, especially with the narrative that Mr. Khan gave mm -hmm. during, his, uh, during his sentencing hearing. Uh, he's going to be released. To, to where? That we're not sure of. You know, he's considered a citizen of Pakistan. Uh, but, but to the Pakistan... I mean, many of these countries have refused to accept these people That's back. That's correct. Also, why? And it exactly. would be dangerous for him to even go back to Pakistan exactly. because he attempted exactly. a suicide bombing run. And he has relatives in the States, correct? That is correct. Yeah, that are U.S. citizens, you think including... Do you think the United States will let him to come here? Absolutely not. No, I not. That's that's not. yeah that that's for sure. And Cuba that's, doesn't want him. I mean. No, Cuba doesn't want him. Yeah, yeah, Cuba doesn't want him. Wow. Okay, so well, that's Guantanamo. So yeah, right, right. What do you think it does to our whole legal history, even in the way? I mean, it really questions our moral authority around the world. Okay, I right. think you know. I mean, uh, it does damage to our our brand that we engage in this type of behavior. Mm -hmm. You know, and again, top people in our own military do not approve of the use of torture mm -hmm. uh, because it doesn't provide you reliable information. Again, off, often the, the torturee just tells you whatever you want to hear mm -hmm. just so that the, the beating or the maltreatment will stop. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it's something that really we should strongly consider not using anymore. No kidding. Uh, yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. But it's also illegal, too. And it's illegal according to U.S. law. Right, but no one's going to go out and arrest George Bush or no. Donald Rumsfeld. No. Oh, they're all gone in the first place. Right, right. Okay, well, that's what's happening this week or this month, right? Sure, yes. Anything else that we need to remind our viewers about? Before Just close? some of the programming that Vicky is doing, if you want to okay. say a word Well, we're going to do this again on Monday evening on a Zoom presentation in which we hope that others can participate. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit more in and depth And maybe about in it. more detail. Right. And until then, I think all of us should be watching the current events and join us on Monday at 6 to talk about the issue of torture and Guantanamo once again. So thank you all for being here with us. Thanks, See everyone. Bye-bye.